Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we are going to be talking about, well, I'm looking at the subtitle, an extraordinary book. The title of the book is No Ordinary Joes, the extraordinary true story of four submariners in war and love and life. The author is Larry Cotton, and he's been good enough to stop by. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jim, for having me. Larry Colton. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. That's okay, Bill. I, that's all right. <laughs> all right, Oswald. Let's just go on with the interview. This is, you know, I, I've, I've read most of this book, and I, I'm, I'm left with a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the, the first one is, why did you write it? Well, even though a large part of it is set in World War II, I'm not a, a World War II buff. I'm not a, um, a military person at all. Um, but I was attracted to the stories of the men. And in particular, it was actually a, initially a love story that, that uh, between Bob and Barbara Palmer that uh-huh. brought me into it because I just found it such a unique thing as to what happened. They came together, they were separated, and they came back together. And so... It, it was a love story that brought me to this. The other thing that uh, – the other question that I had when I was finished is, is, is how did you put it all together? For example, uh, there is uh, something common that the subjects have. That is that they each come out of the Depression era. That is their their youth was there, they're growing up, and they experience the difficulties of, of the Depression. But on the other hand – they're, they're, they come from all over the country. Now, how did you get this together? Well, um, when I initially identified the one character that I was going to write about, then I met the other ones at a sub, submariner uh, interview, and they just sort of stood out. They had because these guys were in their eighties when I met them, yeah, and, and yeah. so they just had a better recall than other guys. And so I did not know their stories before I really launched into it, and so. It was a case of, as it turned out, they all had particular interesting stories about their relationships before and after with their families. Did you wind up at the Submariner Convention because you were a Submariner too? No. No, I was not in the military at okay. all. And so I, just, I got invited to go, and so I went to two of them. And um, one of them in Reno, at least one was in Reno and one was Las Vegas. No, I don't know what those two cities, (laughs) why those two cities, but uh, they ain't near no ocean. (laughs) No, they're not. And but I didn't see all these guys. These guys weren't doing much gambling. They were just there for the camaraderie and they shared such a unique time. It it wasn't just the men of the Grenadier, which is the book that I'm writing about. It was men of all. all, It was, you know, current submariners. So, yeah. yeah. So there's some debate as whether you say submariner or submariner. And I've heard it said both ways. I checked with my wife. She wants me to say submariner. Then let's go with that one. Yeah. You okay. could say submariner if you want. You're I, not married to it. No, I, I, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I write them. I don't have to pronounce them. <laughs> now, one of the things in uh, your background is uh, uh, baseball. And, and you were in baseball apparently before you got into writing. Oh yes, I um, I didn't write any when I was in baseball. I went to uh, UC Berkeley. I graduated from there and then signed a contract and went off to play pro ball. And with whom made it all the way to the major leagues with the with, Phil- with, a, with a team called the Phillies. The yeah. Phillies, yeah, yeah which we know. You're, 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 the Giants just beat, <laughs> but my loyalty is I didn't last long enough in the big leagues. I, my I'm loyal to the Bay Area, just as I root for the Niners and and. Uh, uh, so I was for the Giants. I went to a, a, some friend's house in Piedmont the last game, and they were all shocked that a Philly would be rooting for the Giants. But, um, no, I, I I was raised in California. So. Okay. Now, though you say that you're not particularly an historian of the era of uh, World War II, it seems to me that uh, your description of the attitude – in the Navy at the beginning of World War II is very important. Well, I was able to do a lot of research, not only talking to the men involved, but other things. I went to the National Archives and did a lot of research to to get this uh, background information because I wanted to 
put it in a historical setting. But at its core, this is a book about four men from a greatest, uh, a, the quote unquote greatest generation. Greatest generation. And yeah. these are uh, and these are true heroes. What they go through in in prison camp and in, and in, during the war, but they're also as probably most heroes are. They're flawed heroes. They have the same kind of. Uh, problems that all of us have, and so I, I include those in the book. It's just not about the glory of war. And none of them, uh, although I, I think a couple of them talk about getting into the officer corps, but none of them did. No, these were enlisted men. They they all joined before uh, Pearl Harbor and the outbreak of war, and they all joined primarily. They all dropped out had, had dropped out dropped of high out school. Out of high school, yeah. And what they joined the Navy was because it provided a paycheck and what they call in those days three hots and a cot. <laughs> and so it was a steady job and an income and. and uh, ha- had some security in it because these guys had come out of been annealed in the, the hardship of the um, uh, depression. depression and so yeah. they they were they were tough guys coming in very tough they the way the way they got into the submarine business each of them is kind of in some cases kind of weird you know with the well, they didn't certainly did not. None of them grew up saying, "I want to be a submariner or submariner." <laughs> yeah. They just sort of one was sort of shoved forward to volunteer, and it was out of you know they needed um, people, and they needed bodies because uh, after Pearl Harbor and the surface fleet had been so decimated, it was going to be the submarines that was going to carry the war initially to the Japanese, and they were our primary offensive weapon at that time, even though for the first year they were outfitted with horribly defective torpedoes. The amazing fact that you put out in the first part of the book is the one you just mentioned, that after Pearl Harbor, they were the only ships we had, essentially. Right. And they're going to carry the fight to the Japanese. And then they got out there, and and, and I, I don't, can't remember the exact statistics, but in the first you know, 400 torpedoes fired, there was like three hits and sometimes it'd be almost point blank range. And they just, they, the, they had not tested the torpedoes well enough. And, uh, so it, it is really one of the big military blunders of all time is that they sent these men out there into harm's way. You know, a major portion of no ordinary Joe's involves the boys experiences as POWs. We're going to look at that part of the book when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. No Ordinary Joes. The extraordinary true story of four submariners or submariners in war and love and life. The author is Larry Colton, and it is published by Crown, or as I used to say, Crown Books. But I don't think we say that anymore. I I thought it was Crown Books, but... um, I was looking all over the title page. It just says Crown. Crown. All Uh, right. We'll go with that. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Ron Shelton, who's an award-winning screenwriter and director of Bull Durham, White Men Can't Jump, and Tin Cup. And he's read your book in advance and said some extraordinary things about this book. Larry Colton's Ordinary Joes are just like us, yet they endured war, they endured what we could never imagine, and are ennobled in ways they themselves might not claim. Intimate and epic, unblinking and even-handed, Colton's engrossing story strips sentimentality and cliché away from our notion of hero. That's a nice accomplishment. Uh, That's, yes, Ron Shelton, um, who was also a professional baseball player. Oh, no. The guy who did Bull Durham. (laughs) Uh he, He knew about what he was writing. He damn well did. Yeah. That was a great, that, that is, that is a great movie. This, this notion of, 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 of hero, though, or the false notions of, of hero, is, is that another reason why you wrote the book to, to get at that? 
Well, the whole concept of the greatest generation is sort of, I think it's a, a bit of a myth. I mean, they have their flaws just like every other generation, and certainly they overcame a truly evil uh, aggressor, and they survived the horrible depression and then helped rebuild America, but they might be the most racist. Uh, I, I'm not sure but uh, how you measure that. But, it's a possibility. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but it was a different time, and it, and— uh, so I just wanted to take a closer look at members of that generation. And so this was the story that, that came to me. And um, so it really is a narrative of these four men's lives. So let's meet these No Ordinary Joes. The first one on, on, on my list is Tim McCoy, a.k.a. Skeeter, who's from Dallas. And I, my, my note next to him is the brazen prisoner. He was. If they, if Steve McQueen was still alive, they would uh, cast him to play him in the movie. He, he was the one who confronted the, his Japanese guards. He took them on, and he was the most uh, bold and daring. And he would, whether it be stealing food or whatever it is. I mean, they didn't try to escape because you're on an, you're on in Japan. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Yeah. And so, uh, but he was tough. He, he even fought one of the guards and. So, so fought one. He knocked yeah. him on his keister. Yeah, he did. And <laughs> so, and he had been in scuffles with his own men prior to this. And yeah, so, he was yeah. just a tough guy. And and then after the war, he um, ended up. He served in the um, in the navy for quite a few years after that. But then he became a very successful insurance man and, and made you know millions and lives now in Austin, Texas. Still, he's still with us. He's right? still alive. Yeah. Just as honorary as ever. <laughs> he had a big love in Australia. Yeah, he was he was had gotten engaged just prior to them shipping off on their last thing. They were they were stationed in in uh, Australia on the west side um, in uh, Fremantle in Perth, and he got engaged to Miss Perth. Yes, and but unfortunately, when the war was over. He he was going to send for her to come and join him in America, but that didn't work out. So, not only that, he got the, the you know the total dear John letter. Yes, with he, the engagement ring yeah, and clothes. Yeah, and he'd he'd sent her money to have her come over to America from there, and they planned on getting married in Los Angeles, and it didn't work out. But he then all of these guys, all four of them, ended up getting married within a year after the war, and one of them was married going in. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, kind of in contradistinction uh, to uh, to Tim Skeeter, the fellow from Yakima, Washington, by the name of Gordy Cox. Gordy Cox planned to survive. They all developed their own personal techniques for surviving unimaginable cruelty. And Gordy's was just to lay low, never – you know, speak back to anybody, uh, any of the guards, never to question anything, to do exactly what he was told, and just keep a low profile. And stay, stay under the radar. Stay under the radar. It. it was impossible to stay completely under the radar, and so he was. Um, but he was probably the quietest of them, not only in camp, but he was also just coming naturally. Yeah, he was naturally yeah. quiet. Yeah, and then there's a fellow from a place called Dundee, New York. His name is Chuck Vervalen. Chuck Vervalen, yes. And he he grew up in upstate New York. He wanted to be a harness racer, but um, he ended up joining. He dropped out of school. He joined, um, and then he met a woman uh, prior to his the last patrol uh, from uh, Perth, and they got engaged, and. Um, they ended up, after some struggles, they did get married, and he brought her over to America on the War Brides Act, and it was a pretty contentious marriage for many years, and then they got divorced. They got divorced, yeah. Oh, well, a major portion of No Ordinary Joes involves the boys' experiences uh, in these uh, POW camps, and we're going to look at that part of it very, very briefly. When we come back, you're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email 
Jim Foster, COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. I'm Jim Foster. Our book today is No Ordinary Joes, the extraordinary true story of four submariners in war and love and life. It's by Larry Colton, and it's published by Crown, or Crown Books, if you prefer. It's a subdivision of Random House who actually Everything's writes Everything's a subdivision of Random yeah. House, isn't it? Right. Yeah. A gentleman by the name of John T. Jack Ramsey, a former Navy ensign, has this to say in part, No Ordinary Joes is a marvelous treatment of a special time in American history. Yeah, but look that from the bottom yeah. up, not, not yeah. from the top down. As well as an up-close look at the devastating impact that war can have on the personal lives of those involved. And let's have a 21-gun salute for Larry Colton. Not not in the studio, please. Okay. Not that's in the studio. Jack Ramsey, the um, Hall of Fame basketball coach. In ESP, well, that Jack Ramsey. ESP oh. announcer. He was in the, the uh, underwater demolition. He was actually on his way to Japan when they dropped the atomic bomb. Oh, my gosh. He was, he was in the uh, military during World War II. And the atomic bomb is dropped when these guys are— Prisoners of war. Well, it it actually is what liberated them because if we had, uh, had to invade Japan, the the prisoners would have been just, would have been shot. Yeah, yeah. shot. And so, uh, interestingly, the original target for the second atomic bomb was the town where these guys were at, um, Kakura. But they had been bombed before with incendiary bombs, and there was a, a big haze over the city, and they were not allowed to drop the atomic bomb unless they could see the target. So they went to the secondary target, which was Nagasaki. Hmm. You know, I, I rather than go through, you know, the various things that happened to these fellows uh, as prisoners of war, I want to read something from, from the book. On the morning of September 5, 1945, 30 days after the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Bob, that would be Bob Palmer, Palmer limped out of the Ashio prison using a newly carved tree limb as a cane. Along with the other prisoners, he walked two miles to the train station, boarded a train for the Yokohama, Tokyo area. Climbing aboard the train, and this is where it gets summed up. I think this is wonderfully done. Climbing aboard the train, Bob felt an overwhelming sense of joy and relief over the 28 tortured months as a POW. 28 months. He survived on less than a cup of rice a day received more beatings than he could remember, spent nine months in solitary confinement, performed slave labor in a, in a smelter, watched other prisoners die, lost half his body weight, had no contact with the outside world, and battled beriberi, amoebic dysentery, and dengue fever. And now, now, he was heading home. And yeah. that could have been said about any of them, I yeah, guess. Yeah, it's just unimaginable what they survived. And they even had uh, uh, these guys, uh, there was waterboarding. It wasn't called waterboarding back there. It was just called water torture. And the guards and, and the um, officers yeah. from uh, Japan. Oh, my gosh. I never thought of that. They, who were responsible for that. In the Tokyo war crimes trial after the war. Yeah. These the uh, American military tribunal executed these men. So we executed the Japanese men for waterboarding. And this was back in 1946. And you may sometimes wonder when we decided to do waterboarding, had they, they checked? And plus, these guys all are, are living testimony that torture doesn't work. Aren't they? I they, hadn't they, thought of that. They didn't reveal any information. And uh, the Japanese were not able to uh, break these guys down, despite what they did to them. And so, and these guys are, even though they come from wide political uh, divergent backgrounds, are, are thinking that America was only lowering their standards by doing torture. You know, I'd like you to read part of your own book, if you wouldn't mind. It starts on, on this page right there, later that day. And the, the, the context of it is uh, somebody has just died. One of them has died. 
Later that day, Johnny Johnson told Chuck that Charles Doyle was dead. Chuck struggled to stay composed, first Guayco, then Linder, and now his buddy Doyle, the Red Sox fan. He and Doyle would never have a chance to go to a game together. He volunteered to help depose of the body. He lifted his friend onto a pushcart and, accompanied by a guard, wheeled Doyle out of the camp toward the town of Tubata, two miles away. The journey was slow, the road slippery and full of holes. Chuck had never been philosophical or spiritual, but pushing Doyle's body along the bumpy road gave him pause. Being a submariner had allowed him to maintain a distance from the violence. You fire a torpedo or a deck gun, and you don't see the eyes of the enemy. You don't have your buddy blown to bits next to you in a foxhole or while landing on a beach. And even though other prisoners had been dying every day since they had arrived in Japan, he didn't know those men. This was different. That's that's a very, very moving piece of the book. And, and I think it really gets in inside the mind. And when, when Chuck Vervalen told me this story, and it was 60 years after the the uh, fact, he got all teared up and, and um, very emotional when he told me that story. Well, when you get this book and you start reading it, you might tear up too. But I really believe it's a book you oughtn't miss. No Ordinary Joes is the title, the subtitle, The Extraordinary True Story of Four Submariners in War and Love and Life by Larry Colton. And this has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email jimfostercoc at gmail.com.